Lesson 54. Impersonal Verbs, Noun Clauses, Caesar, Book 1, Chapter 4, Begun. Hi everyone, welcome back to Lenny's Latin Class. Today we're on page 162. Again, that's Lesson 54. And we're going to talk about a couple of things that we've already discussed in the past, but here we're going to address them in a more formal way. You may notice that from here to the end of the book, the authors of the book may be rehashing things or reviewing things, scanning ahead briefly. I see in Lesson 61, they're talking about the passive periphrastic, which we've discussed many times. In Lesson 65, they're talking about indefinite pronouns, which I'm pretty sure we've talked about. In Lesson 67, they talk about the dative case. Again, they're sort of a review of the dative. In Lesson 70, they have a big section on indirect discourse, which we've already talked about many, many, many times. So from here to the end of the book, you may notice that it's not going to just be a flood of new material. It's going to be sort of taking a look at the things you already know and sort of having big reviews looking at things from more of a bird's eye view, categorizing things, mopping up little things we may have missed. You know, in this book, the whole book, as you know well, is centered around reading Caesar's Gallic Wars. That's the whole purpose of the book, is to teach you Latin grammar so that you can read Caesar's Gallic Wars. And so in doing so, the authors of the book oftentimes give you things before you're ready. They just put things in footnotes to help you read, even though you haven't formally been introduced to those things yet. So what I've been doing is trying to explain some of those things to you in sort of a piecemeal fashion. So at this point, we're in Lesson 54. So probably a lot of the things that we're going to run into at this point are things that I've already explained to you in some fashion before. And for that reason, I'm going to take less time to re-explain things. And why is that? Well, from this point to the end of the book, every lesson contains a section of Caesar's Gallic Wars. You know, earlier in the book, many of the lessons were just presentations of grammar items. And then at the end of the lesson, there would be some exercises. But in many of those lessons, there was no passage from Caesar's Gallic Wars, simply because you weren't ready for them yet. You didn't have enough knowledge. Now, we are way past the halfway point, and you have a good basic knowledge. You have sort of a what you might refer to as a critical mass of Latin grammar knowledge. And so now, from here to the end, by the way, the series has 73 lessons. The, the book has 73 chapters or lessons, and therefore 73 lectures that go along with it. And so from here to the end, every lesson is going to have a passage from Caesar's Gallic Wars. And what that means is that the lessons are going to be a bit longer. So in order to prevent these lessons from becoming interminably long, I'm going to try to go over the material a bit quicker, especially items which we've already covered in the past. I'm going to try to repeat myself a little bit less so that we can focus less on grammar presentation and more on the actual readings at the end of the lesson. Because again, every lesson from now on is going to have a passage from Julius Caesar. So with all that in mind, let's go back to page 162. And let's go through lesson 54, starting with impersonal verbs. In section 428, the authors of the book tell us that impersonal verbs are verbs that have no personal subject. That is, there's no person or animal who is doing the action. You're talking about a general activity that is occurring. And they give a perfect example here. They talk about rain. In English, when we say, it is raining, that's a perfect example of an impersonal verb. It's impersonal in the sense that there's no person out there doing the raining. 
It's just a general statement saying that rain is going on. Raining is occurring. Same thing with the expression, it happens. They have a couple of examples here. In example one, it says, verbs taking a phrase or a clause as their subject. And then they have the verb akedit, which means it happened. And then after that, you can have ut, and you can say things like akedit, ut, eset, luna, plena. It happened that there was a full moon. So why do they describe that as a sentence in which a phrase or clause is the subject? Because you can view the phrase, there was full moon, you can view that phrase or sense unit as the subject of akedit. You could say, the fact that there was a full moon happened. So you could think of everything from ut to plena as one unit a noun clause, which then is the subject of akedit. And we've actually talked about noun clauses many times in the past, so I don't really need to repeat this over again. Another thing you'll see occasionally is a passive verb used to express impersonal action. For example, in example two here, they have pugnatur. That's a passive verb. Literally, it is being fought. It's third person singular. Passive, you know, if you think of the subject as it, you could say it is being fought. And the idea being expressed is that there is fighting going on. It's impersonal in the sense that there's no one specific person doing the fighting. You're not saying the Romans are fighting. There's no clearly defined subject to tell you exactly who is doing the fighting. It's just a general statement saying that. Fighting is occurring. There is fighting going on. And interestingly, the authors of the book are pointing out here that the verb pugno is intransitive. You know, an intransitive verb is a verb that does not or cannot take a direct object. For example, the verb swim. If I say, I am swimming, there's really no way to have a direct object with that. I don't swim water. That doesn't really make any sense. It's just, I am swimming. And so that kind of verb is intransitive. And they correctly point out that pugno is also intransitive. In English, we use the verb fight in more of a transitive way. We can say things like, I fought you or I fought Fred. But in Latin, as you may have noticed, the verb pugno gets used sometimes with the preposition cum. We've seen sentences that say uh, the Romans are fighting with the Helvetii. So in Latin, the verb pugno needs a little help from a preposition to show exactly who the fighting is being done against. And so the authors of the book correctly point out that pugno in Latin is intransitive. So here we have an intransitive verb in the passive, and it's expressing generalized action, that there is fighting going on, pugnatur. And in Latin, there are lots of different expressions that have impersonal verbs. In 429, we see a list of them, a partial list. There's many more besides these. We just studied the second one, akedit. It's hard to tell if akadit is present or perfect because it looks the same in both of those forms. And then we have the verb fio in the third person, verbs like fit and factum est, it happens or it happened. Liket is a verb from the verb likeo. This is the third person singular form of that. Liket means something like it is allowed or it is permitted. We get our English word licentious from this root. Also, the English word illicit. If something is illicit, that means it's not allowed. The I-L at the beginning is a negative. It's really I-N, but the N gets turned into an L through assimilation. So, in licio means something like to not be allowed. Oportet is another good one to know. 
here they give the definition as it is necessary, but it can also have the meaning of something like it is fitting or it is proper, not so much it is necessary. I guess if something is fit or proper, you could view it as being necessary, but don't associate a portet with only the meaning of it is necessary because it can mean other things besides that. And then uh, pugnatur, we just studied that one. And off the top of my head, I can think of several more impersonals like nekesa est, it is necessary. You can use nekesa est along with an infinitive. For example, the uh, infinitive ambulare, which means to walk. I could say nekesa est ambulare ad, you know, wherever. It is necessary to walk to someplace. That's just a simple example. One definitely good way to talk about needing something is to say opus est. Opus est is an expression that means there is need of. And then the thing that's needed goes in the ablative case. So if I want to say we have a need for food or there is a need for food or food is needed, I can say opus est kibbo. Notice that kibbos is in the ablative case there, working along with opus est. There's also the verb prodest, which means something like it is beneficial or it is advantageous. There are expressions like taedet, T-A-E-D-E-T. Taedet means something like it wearies me. That's related to our English word tedious. And there's also piget, P-I-G-E-T, which means something like it disgusts me. So in Latin, we have lots of these little impersonal, uh, third-person, singular expressions like that. I would say that probably akadit, liket, and oportet, probably those are the most common ones. So these are good expressions to know about for any Latin student. Let's go on to section 430, and let's talk about noun clauses. We've talked about this many times, so this is really review. A noun clause is when a group of words, like a phrase, forms one unit and then functions as a subject of a sentence or as the direct object of a sentence. And we even mentioned it in this very lesson toward the beginning. So they show a few examples here. Example one, by an indicative introduced by the conjunction quod. You know, we've talked about how quod can mean something like the fact that or simply that. And this first word here, ake debat, that's the first one on the list they gave us back in section 429. Akedit, it's not akedit, but it's akedit. It's really, I believe, the verb kedo, C-E-D-O, with the preposition odd on the front. So odd kedo, which would literally mean something like to move toward something or move to the D in odd gets turned into a C due to assimilation. So odd kedo becomes akedo. And we have an impersonal use here. So akedebat, it was added. And then quod flumen erat latum is a noun clause. The fact that the river was wide. The fact that the river was wide, that was added. So in a sense, Quod flumen erat latum is one sense unit that is functioning as the subject of a sentence. And so that's why they call it a noun clause, is because it's a clause functioning simply as a noun. So quod flumen erat latum, that phrase, is just like a noun that is the subject of this sentence. So the fact that the river was broad was added. But to make it smoother English, we could say there was added the fact that the river was broad. So in that example, you get some practice with a noun clause and with an impersonal, ake debat. Moving to the top of page 163, they say by a subjunctive introduced by ut, ne, queen. Notice how they're pointing out places to review because this is review. We've talked about this before. When we studied the verb fio, we had sentences like the one here in number two. 
fiebat ut flumen aset latum. It happened that the river was broad. Again, we have a noun clause, flumen aset latum, the river was broad, that happened. Okay, so in a sense, that is a noun clause functioning as the subject of fiebat. Technically, fiebat is passive, so you could say that the river was broad happened, or that the river was broad occurred. You could think of it like that. To put it into smooth English, we might say something like, it so happened that the river was broad. That's a bit smoother. I'm simply breaking down the grammar for you so you can see it from different angles. Notice that in number one, the verb is not subjunctive. Erat in number one is indicative, but in number two, as they say, it's subjunctive. It's eset. And that's what has to happen with ut, ne, or queen. Those words trigger a subjunctive verb. So number one has an indicative verb. Number two, with ut, has a subjunctive verb. In number three, we have indirect discourse. Dikit says, he, she, or it says. And then we have indirect speech. Flumen is the subject accusative. Esse is the infinitive verb of the indirect speech. And latum is a predicate accusative. So Dikit, flumen, he says that the river, and then esse means is, latum means broad. Latum is accusative because it has to match with flumen. Also, latum is uh, neuter because it has to match with flumen. Why are they presenting this as a noun clause? Because you could think of flumen esse latum, you could think of that little clause as one unit that is the direct object of dekit. He says blank. He says something, and then Flumen esse latum is one phrase. So it's indirect speech, but we're looking at it right now from the angle of noun clauses. So you could think of flumen esse latum as a noun clause that is the direct object of dekit. It's just another way to look at it uh, as far as studying the concept of noun clauses. Let's move on to section 431 and look at our vocabulary. First, we have an interesting word, poina, poinai, which is a feminine noun of the first declension. It means punishment. Notice that the O and the E form a diphthong, so it's not poina, it's poina. We have a couple of English words that are remotely related to poina. One is the word punitive. It's got a difference in spelling, but etymologically, I think it is related. Punitive means something that's related to punishment. It's also a distant relative of the word punishment itself. And this word may be a distant relative of our English word penitentiary, which is a fancy word for a prison. I can't fully tell if it's related or not, but there is some roundabout relationship, I think. So take that with a grain of salt. Moving on, we have ignis, which means fire. That's a third declension masculine noun that is the same spelling in its nominative singular form and genitive singular form. So you have to use context to figure out, you know, if you see the word ignis, you have to use context to figure out what case it is. Of course, since it's third declension, you know, if you see the ablative plural form, that would be ignibus. So forms like that are easier to tell. Occasionally, you'll find third declension nouns that have a, a same nominative and, and genitive. Moving on, we have mos moris, which means custom. That's another third declension noun. We've seen this one before in the expression mos maiorum, which means the custom of the ancestors. Today, in the United States of America, we have a written constitution. Our constitution is written, everyone can see what it says, and it's extremely difficult to change. Our founding fathers planned it out that way so that we 
can't easily change the different powers allotted to offices such as the office of president, the powers of Congress. So everything was established in writing from the very beginning and made very difficult to change. In many countries, they can just pass a quick law that changes their constitution. And people do that in other countries quite often. You'll see it happen a lot when a leader wants to extend his or her time in office. But in the United States, we have a constitution that is, you know, written out, printed, and hard to change. In ancient Rome, they had a constitution too, but it was not written. It was a constitution built up over time by tradition and precedent. And so that's how we get the expression mos maiorum. Maiorum is a genitive plural. It means of the greater ones in the sense of of the ancestors or of the forefathers. So mos maiorum is a term used to describe the ancient Roman constitution. And because it wasn't written down, people could break the rules without actually breaking the letter of the law. They could find little cracks and little uh, loopholes to try to get through. And since it wasn't really written down, it wasn't hard for them to do that. So mos maiorum is a good term to know for any student of Latin. Moving on, we have acensus, acensus. That's a fourth declension noun, masculine. That means ascent. You can see our English word ascent or ascend are directly related to it. Next, we have cremo, cremare. That's a first conjugation verb. That means to burn. And of course, our English word cremate is related to this verb. And then along with the noun igni, uh, igni would be ablative singular. It forms an expression, burn to death. So cremo plus igni, literally burn with fire, apparently is an expression that means burn to death. And I'm guessing that we will see that in our passage of Caesar's Gallic Wars. Okay, let's go on to section 432. That's our translation section for this lesson. Go ahead and do all the exercises except number two. Turn off the recording, try them on your own. And when you're done, turn the recording back on, and we'll go over them together. Okay, hopefully by now you've completed your homework. Let's go over these exercises together, starting with number one. Number one says, Poinam sequi oportet. As we learned in this lesson, oportet is an impersonal verb. That means something like, it is fitting, it is right, it is proper. It is necessary. And so in this sentence, oportet starts off something that looks very much like indirect speech. At bare minimum, it's an accusative plus infinitive construction. Usually when we talk about indirect speech, we talk about it being started off by verbs of the head or heart, verbs like saying or thinking or feeling something. So here, oportet is not exactly a verb of saying or thinking. If the sentence said, dicit poinam sequi, then it's just straight indirect speech. There's no question about it. So I don't know if technically we can call this indirect speech, but we'll translate it just as if it were indirect speech. Oportet will say, it is fitting. And then we have an accusative plus infinitive construction with poinam as the subject accusative. So poinam means punishment. Sequi means follow. That's the present tense infinitive of sequor. So number one says, it is fitting that punishment follow. In this lesson, we've been looking at noun clauses. If you want, you could think of poinam sequi as a noun clause that is the subject of oportet. So the idea of punishment following that idea, oportet, that idea is fitting. But to put it into smoother English, we would simply say, it is fitting that punishment follow. So poinam and sequi, they have a 
an accusative plus infinitive construction, but we wouldn't necessarily call it indirect speech. We would just call it an accusative plus infinitive construction. Let's skip over number two and go to number three. Frumentum militibus dare oportebit. Here we have the verb oporto, uh, and it's in the future tense. Oportebit is third person singular future. So oportebit would say something like, it will be fitting, it will be proper, it will be necessary. And then we have a noun clause. Dare means to give. Frumentum means grain. And then militibus, that's dative plural for the word soldier, miles. So it means to the soldiers. So literally, to give grain to the soldiers will be fitting. Or it will be fitting or it will be necessary to give grain to the soldiers. Again, we could think of this as a noun clause with frumentum, militibus, and dare, those three words together forming a noun clause that is the subject of oportebit. So the idea of giving grain to the soldiers, that's the subject, and it will be fitting, or it will be proper, or it will be necessary. And to take it a bit further, I would say that really dare here is the subject of the sentence, to give. So here we have an example of an infinitive working as the subject of a sentence, just as a noun would. And so this is an example of how there is no nominative gerund. And so here we have dare working as a noun, just as a gerund would. But since there's no nominative gerund, you have a, an infinitive doing the work of a nominative gerund. So to give will be fitting. To give will be proper. To give will be necessary. That's really the structure of it. And then frumentum is just a direct object of dare. So here you have an example of an infinitive working as a noun. It's part of a larger noun clause. But even without frumentum and without militibus, the sentence makes perfect sense on its own. To give will be fitting. So number three says, it will be proper to give grain to the soldiers. Or perhaps it will be necessary to give grain to the soldiers. Number four is next. Renuntiatum est ascensum montis faculum esse. Now this particular sentence has an accusative plus infinitive construction in it. Ascensum plus esse. And here I would say it really does qualify more as indirect speech. Why? Because renunciatum est is a verb of speaking. The verb here is renuntio. Nuntio means to announce or tell. And so renuntio, the prefix re has to do with something coming back to you or something coming again to some place. So when I think of the verb renuntio, I think of soldiers are out there finding things and they report back. They bring back intelligence. They bring back a report. And in fact, the English word report also has that same prefix, re and porto, to carry back. Renuntio means to report back or to announce something. Again, I envision information coming back to the camp from people that were outside of the camp. And this is third person singular, passive, perfect tense. So renuntiatum est says, he, she, or it was reported. He, she, or it was announced. And that is a verb of speaking. When you announce or report something, you're telling someone something, right? You're saying things. And now we go to the indirect speech part of the sentence. Ascensum, that means the ascent. Montes means of the mountain. And then the verb is esse, which means is. And then facile is an adjective that means easy. Here it's in the accusative case because it's modifying ascensum. And remember that 
when you have indirect speech, the infinitive verb of the indirect speech is relative to the tense of the main verb. The main verb here, renuntiatum est, that is in a past tense. So esse, being a present tense infinitive, that needs to go in the same tense as the main verb. Okay, a present tense infinitive in indirect speech, that gets put into the same tense. It's relative to the main verb in the sense that it's the same tense as the main verb. So really, is is not a good translation for esse. We really need to say was. Renunciatum est, it was announced. You could make it sound impersonal like that. It was announced that the ascent of the mountain was easy. Viewing this from the perspective of a noun clause, we could say that from ascensum to the end is a noun clause. That the ascent of the mountain was easy, that whole thing, renuntiatum est, that was announced. So you could view ascensum montes faculum esse as a noun clause that is the subject of the compound verb renuntiatum est. The fact that the ascent of the mountain was easy, that was announced. It was announced. So that's one way to look at the structure of it. To put it into smoother English, we should treat renuntiatum est as an impersonal, with the subject being it. So it was announced, and then we can throw in the word that and say, it was announced that the ascent of the mountain was easy. So a couple of different ways to look at it there, just for your knowledge. Moving on to number five, du atque acreter pugnatum est. Here we have an impersonal verb as our main verb. That's pugnatum est. Back near the beginning of this lesson, they showed us pugnatur, which means there is fighting going on. Literally, it is being fought. That's a classic case of an impersonal verb. And so here in number five, we have it, but in the perfect tense. Literally, it was fought. Notice that pugnatum here is neuter. Pugnatur in the present tense is not gendered. It's just, it is being fought. But in the perfect tense, if you want to make a passive verb, you have to have a perfect passive participle. And that means you have to apply some kind of gender to it. You have to put it in the masculine, feminine, or neuter. So it's worthy of notice that pugnatum here is neuter. Again, this maps on well to our English idea of it. You know, it is raining, it is hot outside, that kind of thing. So notice that this impersonal verb here is neuter in gender. This is a gendered verb because it has a participle as part of it. So pugnatum est, literally, it was fought, but we can translate it into English as there was fighting, or fighting was occurring, or there was fighting going on, something like that. And then du means for a long time, atque means and, acreter means bitterly. That's an adverb. You can translate acrater various ways, vehemently, strongly, bitterly, fiercely. So let's translate number five as fighting went on for a long time and bitterly or and fiercely. Number six is next. Abhora septima ad vesperum Pugnatum erat. Here we have the same kind of verb, except it's pluperfect. Notice that it's pugnatum plus an imperfect form of sum. Uh, that's erat, not est, but erat. So we can say something like, there had been fighting going on, or there had been fighting occurring. Literally, it had been fought. Again, notice that this gendered verb is in the neuter gender. We have that neuter participle there. 
Abhora Septima means from the seventh hour. Hora means hour. Septima means seventh. And Ad Vesperum means to evening. So number six says, there had been fighting going on from the seventh hour to evening. And when they say the seventh hour, they don't mean seven o'clock a.m. I believe that that is time that is rendered from sunrise. So I think the seventh hour would be something like noon or midday. You know, the sun rises at different times uh, in the different times of the year. So clock times weren't very exact. But I think the basic thing being communicated here is that the battle went on from about midday all the way to evening. So the entire afternoon, all the way into evening, the battle was raging. That's kind of what number six is saying here. Number seven is next. Helwete is est in animo iter facere. We have a couple of idioms here. First of all, iter facere, as you know, means to make a trip to make a journey, to make a march, something like that. And that's really the subject of the sentence. That's a noun clause, etier facere. Really, facere here is an infinitive functioning as a noun. That's really the subject of the sentence. And then etier is the direct object of facere. And then est in animo means to be in mind, literally, to be in your mind in the sense that you are thinking about doing it or perhaps you intend to do it. So the part about being in animo, that has to do with being in mind in the sense of intending to do something. And then helwetiis is dative plural, and that's dative of possession. So it is in mind to the Helwetii in the sense of dative of possession. It is to them in the sense that they have it. So to put this in smooth English, we might say the Helwetii have it in mind in the sense of the Helwetii intend. Again, here we have basically three idioms crammed together. We have dative of possession, which is a little bit idiomatic. We have the idea of it is in animo, that's another idiom, and then iter facere is yet another idiom. So three Latin idioms kind of crammed into one short sentence. Literally, it says something like, to make a journey is in mind to the hell way to e. That's literally how you might read it. But to put it into smooth English, we could translate it like this, the hell way to e intend to make a journey. And that translation, of course, is completely not literal. We're changing some things around, but that's how we can make it into smooth English. Number eight is next. Legati dicunt sibi esse in animo sine ulo maleficio iter per provinciam facere. Okay, so here legati means ambassadors or envoys, people who are diplomats going to talk to someone. We've also seen the word legatus mean like a lieutenant general, a high-ranking general, but here it doesn't mean that. Here it means ambassador or envoy. So legati and decunt together say the ambassadors are saying. And then it kicks off indirect speech. The verb of the indirect speech is esse. And we have a couple of the same idioms we saw in number seven. We have iter facere, and we have the idea of something being in animo, that is, being in mind, in the sense of intending to do something. So a couple of those same idioms from number seven, except here, they're in indirect speech. So instead of est in animo, we have esse in animo. Okay, so the ambassadors are saying that esse in animo, it is in mind. 
Sibi means to them. That's a reflexive pronoun in the dative case. So that's referring back to the ambassadors. So the ambassadors are saying that it is in mind to them in the sense of that they intend. So the ambassadors are saying that they intend. That's what all this uh, business from Sibi all the way to Animo, that's what that means is they are saying that they intend. And what is it that they intend to do? They intend to iterfakere, to make a trip, make a journey, make a march. And iter and fakere are sandwiching the prepositional phrase per provinciam. That means through the province. The province being referred to here is the Roman province known as Provincia. I think at one time it was called Gallia Narbonensis, if I remember correctly. But anyway, it's what would be today the southern part of France. In fact, the name Provincia still exists in the French word Provence, which is what it's called today, an echo of the Latin word Provincia. So the ambassadors are saying that they intend to make a journey through the province sine ulo maleficio, without any mischief or without any wrongdoing or without any evil doing. Okay, so sine means without, it takes the ablative. Ulo means any, it's A-N-Y. By the way, that's one of those naughty nine adjectives. And maleficio means something like evil doing, wrongdoing, mischief. So sine ulo maleficio means without any mischief or without any shenanigans, without any wrongdoing. So number eight says, the ambassadors are saying that they intend to make a journey through the province without any mischief. Number nine is next. Id eis facere licet. Here we have the impersonal verb licet which means it is permitted. And then aes is dative plural. It means to them. So aes and licket together would say it is permitted to them. And then, uh, you know, it's a little complicated, but basically id and facere together, they are working together to form a noun clause. Id is the direct object of facere. We have a footnote here, number three. Let's read what that says. Yeah, footnote three says object of facere. So the word order is not really helping us here. It's sort of a word salad. But nevertheless, the way it adds up is that id is the direct object of facere. So facere and id together say to do it. To do it. That noun clause, that's the subject of licket. So to do it is permitted to them. That's literally how the sentence reads. To put it into smooth English, we would use the word it. We would say it is permitted to them to do it. A little bit different wording there, but literally, facere id, that noun clause, really is the subject of the verb licket. Licket is impersonal, but it also has that noun clause there being the subject. Again, it's a little complicated, but that's how it adds up. It is permitted to them to do it. Number 10 is next. Legati rogant ut id sibi facere liceat. Here we have a little bit of what we saw in number 9, except here it's subjunctive. The structure here really looks like an indirect command. We have legati as the subject, that's uh, the ambassadors. And then we have a verb rogant here, which we could classify as a verb of asking or demanding or commanding. So legati and rogant together say the ambassadors are asking. Then we have ut, and then we have a verb in the subjunctive. So really, this is a classic case of an indirect command. 
We have a verb of asking or commanding or demanding. We have ut, and then a verb in the subjunctive. That's the recipe for an indirect command. Okay, so the ambassadors are asking that. That's how we'll translate ut. And then again, we have facere and id forming a noun clause. To do it, and that noun clause there is the subject of licheat. Notice that licheat is subjunctive. If it were indicative, it would just be licheat. But with the a in there, it's licheat, present tense, subjunctive. So literally, it would be the ambassadors are asking that to do it be permitted to them. Again, sibi is dative. Sibi does not have singular and plural forms. It's just the same, whether it's dative singular or dative plural. So the ambassadors are asking that to do it be permitted to them. But to put it in smoother English, we could say the ambassadors are asking that it be permitted for them to do it. That's more idiomatic English, but that's not literal. Number 11 is next. More Caesaris. Caesaris is genitive singular of Julius Caesar's name, so that means of Caesar. And then more is the third declension noun, mos mores, which means custom, tradition, things like that. And so more here is ablative singular, so we could translate it as in the custom, by the custom, according to the custom. We have a footnote here, footnote four. Let's see what it says. According to the custom. So number 11 says, according to the custom of Caesar. Number 12 is next. Moribus helvetiorum. Very similar to number 11, we have mos moris, that third declension noun that means custom, and it's being possessed by a genitive, in this case, genitive plural. Moribus is ablative plural, so we can say according to the customs, and then of the helvetii. So number 12 says according to the customs of the helvetii, or of the helvetians. Number 13 is next. Caesar dicit se more populi Romani non posse iter dare. Here we have a classic case of indirect speech or indirect discourse. The subject is Caesar. The verb is dicit. That's present tense. Caesar says or Caesar is saying. And then for the indirect speech, we need a subject accusative, that's say, and we need an infinitive to be the verb, that's uh, non posse. So say is referring back to Caesar, that's a reflexive pronoun. It's the same as sibi, except sibi is dative, say is accusative. So we're seeing quite a few reflexive pronouns here. So Caesar is saying that he, that's how the indirect speech starts out. And then non posse. Posse is a present tense infinitive of the verb posum. So what that gives us so far is Caesar says that he is not able. And then we have more here, which means according to the custom. Populi Romani is genitive. That means of the Roman people. So according to the custom of the Roman people, that's what that little phrase says. And when you have posum, a lot of times you'll have a complementary infinitive along with that. And so that's what dare is. Dare is the present tense infinitive of the verb do, which means give. By the way, the verb do is irregular in the infinitive. Dare, there is no long a. The a is short. So instead of dare, it's dare. And the perfect tense form is dedi, which is irregular. It's not dawi, which is what you might expect. So literally, it says, Caesar says that he, according to the custom of the Roman people, 
is not able to give a journey. Here, dare, it doesn't necessarily mean give. It means something more like allow or permit or really a grant might be a good way to do it. Grant, you know, in the sense of giving, but in the sense of giving as far as granting or allowing. That's really what it's saying here. And so what this sentence is saying is that Caesar is not going to give the Helvetii permission to go across Roman territory. That's how the war with the Helvetii gets started in the first place, is, as you know, the Helvetii want to burn all their possessions and do a mass exodus out of Helvetia, which is today Switzerland. And so as part of their grand plan, they ask permission of the Romans to cross across a small stretch of Roman territory. And of course, Caesar is in charge of Gaul, or the Roman part of Gaul, that is. And so they ask Caesar permission. They say, hey, can we take a shortcut across your territory? It'll save us a lot of time. It's just a little thin stretch of your territory that we want to go on. But can you do us a favor and let us cut across there and take a shortcut? And basically, Caesar's answer is, no, you can't do that. And so that's the context for exercise 13. So exercise 13 as a whole says, Caesar says that he, according to the custom of the Roman people, is not able to grant the journey in the sense of give permission for the journey. Number 14 is next. Ake debat quod gali Romanos opida occupare conari existimabant. As you can see from footnote number five, the authors of the book want us to translate ake debat as it was added in the sense of there was an additional reason. And actually, this was the first word we studied in section 429, akedit. It's really the verb kedo, uh, C-E-D-O. If you look up kedo in the dictionary, it'll say things like go, move, or yield. We have English words like seed. If, uh, if one country decides to seed territory to another country, that's a C-E-D-E. And it's also embedded in words like secede or concede. But this is odd plus kado. The idea is to move toward something in the sense of add to it. So odd kado, the D turns into a C and you get a kado. So literally, a debat is imperfect tense, active, third person singular. So it says something like it added. It's not passive. It's not it was added, but literally it added. Of course, uh, above in section 430, at the very bottom of the page, you'll see it says ake debat is translated as there was added. When you translate it that way, it's not literal. If you say there was added, that makes it sound passive. So this is idiomatic speech. This is not exactly literal kind of Latin. This is, we're, we're translating a, a kind of a Latin idiom. The idea is something like, not only that, but also, or perhaps one of my all-time favorite words, furthermore, or sometimes you'll hear people say, and what's more. So in English, we have different ways of adding something to what we've already said. Just for consistency, we'll translate ake debat as there was added. After all, this is a lesson on impersonal verbs, and it's been presented as part of a lesson on impersonal verbs, so it only makes sense that we would translate it in an impersonal kind of way. So ake debat, we can translate in an impersonal kind of way as there was added. But it's interesting to think about that literally it might say something like, it came to this. It also came up. 
I guess if you really wanted to try to figure out the literal meaning. Uh, moving on, we'll translate quote as the fact that. So Ake Debat and quote will say, there was added the fact that, and then we have a sentence here, a clause that is the, the thing that's being added. And Gali is the subject. And the verb here is existemabant. That means to think in the sense of suppose or perhaps believe something. So Gali and existemabant will say something like the Gauls thought or the Gauls were thinking. And that will take us into indirect discourse. Within indirect discourse, you have to have a subject accusative. That's Romanos. And you need to have an infinitive verb, and that's conari. Ocupare is a complementary infinitive working from conari. So this indirect speech says this. The Gauls were thinking that the Romans were trying to seize. Okay, so that's how it adds up. Existamabant is the main verb that starts off the indirect speech. It's in the imperfect tense. So konari, the infinitive verb of the indirect speech, that has to be translated tense-wise in relationship to existamabant. Konari is a present tense infinitive, so we have to put it in the same tense as the main verb. The main verb is existamabant. It's in a past tense, so we need to make konari sound like it's in the past too, because it, it is in the past. It's in the same time frame as existemabant. So we'll say, the Gauls were thinking that the Romans were trying, and then again, ocupare is a complementary infinitive working from konari, and that means something like to seize or take possession, and it has its own direct object. Opida, which means towns. So number 14 altogether says, there was added the fact that the Gauls were thinking that the Romans were trying to seize the towns. So we have several layers of activity going on in that particular exercise. You have sort of a, an outside frame to the sentence. That's ake debat. And then quod gets you into the next clause, which is uh, gali existemabant. And then within that, there's indirect speech. And then within that, within the indirect speech, there's a complementary infinitive with its own direct object. So there's three or four different layers, sort of like an onion, like when you peel the layers of an onion. This sentence has several layers to it. Kind of a neat example of how in Latin you can just have a clause within a clause and you can just keep having more and more smaller clauses within those. Number 15 is next. Veretur ne hoc facias. I'm afraid that this is a clause of fearing. We have the verb veretur. That's a form of the verb vereor, which means to fear. It's a deponent verb. So Weretor says he, she, or it fears. With the word ne here, it's going to tell us the thing that you're afraid someone will do. With ut, it tells you the thing that you're afraid someone will not do. Within the clause of fearing, we have a subjunctive verb. That's fakias. That's the verb fakio in the second person singular, subjunctive. And then hulk is the neuter direct object of Fakias. So number 15 says, he fears that you will do this. You could also say, he fears that you might do this. I suppose you could either say will or might. Either way is probably going to capture what's going on here. If you say, he fears that you might do this, that captures the subjunctive nature of the verb, but it really adds a bit more uncertainty than the, the Latin is communicating. The Latin has more of a feeling of certainty to it than that. So for me, 
saying he fears that you will do this, even though it's not literal, to me it captures the flavor of the Latin a little bit more accurately. Remember that grammarians tell us that this kind of sentence started out originally as two different clauses. Imagine a period after veretur and then a new sentence starting with ne. Then it would say, he fears, may you not do this. And so what that adds up to is, he's afraid that you will do this. Moving on to number 16, we have the same thing, but with ut. They're just giving us these clauses here for practice. So, veretur ut hoc facias. He fears that you will not do this. Again, grammarians tell us that this kind of thing started out as two separate sentences. Imagine a period after the word veretur, and you get, he fears, may you do this, meaning he fears that you will not do it. So again, these clauses of fearing are somewhat idiomatic. Again, you could say might He fears that you might not do this, but I think it's a little bit better sounding in English to use the future tense and say, he fears that you will not do this. That's it for our exercises. Let's move on to section 434, and we have a short passage from Caesar's Gallic Wars, just three lines. When last we left Orgetorix, he was going around talking to disaffected disgruntled noblemen in Gaul, in the different tribes, trying to stir up a revolution, making shady backroom deals. So now we're continuing on, reading more about what Orgetorix is trying to accomplish. Let's read this first sentence together. Ea reis est heloetiis per indicium enuntiata. The subject here is reis, and it's got ea along with it, Race is feminine, so it needs the feminine form of isaia id, which is ea. So ea race says something like this thing. Of course, it's better to translate it in a more specific kind of way. Instead of saying this thing, we could say this plan, this scheme, this situation. There are several ways you could render it into English. Why don't we try scheme? Let's say this scheme, and then we have a compound verb, est and enuntiata really are working together. So if we take enuntiata and est and put them together, we have a perfect tense passive verb. It was reported or it was announced. Notice that enuntiata is feminine. Because race is feminine, and so enuntiata needs to match the uh, gender of race of the subject. So, so far that gives us this scheme was reported. And to whom was it reported? Helwetiis. We have uh, Helwetiis in the dative plural. They're the ones that it was reported to. So, this scheme was reported to the Helwetii. And the word indicium means something like evidence or proof or some kind of information. Perhaps intelligence is a good way to translate it. In other words, someone got a hold of some information and reported it back to the hell way to E. So pair means through and indicium means, well, let's translate it as intelligence or perhaps information. And so the first sentence says, this scheme was reported to the Helwetii through intelligence. Moving to the next sentence, we have, Moribus suis orgetorigem ex vinculis causam dicere coegerunt. Moribus suis says, according to their customs. And we don't have an explicitly stated subject here. In this sentence, we have coegerunt, that's uh, co plus ago, co ago, which is really con plus ago. It can mean things like uh, gather, or it can mean to force someone to do something or to compel someone 
to do something. Here, probably compel is a good way to translate it. So, koegerunt, being perfect tense, would say something like, they compelled. Who is the they? Well, probably the Hilwaiti'i, perhaps government officials, tribal leaders, people in charge, uh, the aristocracy in charge of the Hilwaiti'i. They compelled, and then we have orgetorigim. They compelled Orgeterix. So here we see Orgeterix is getting in trouble for what he's been trying to do. This uh, backroom scheming has caught up with him, and now he's in trouble. Going from Koegerunt, we have an accusative plus infinitive construction. It's not exactly indirect speech because it doesn't start with a verb of saying or thinking. Nevertheless, it does have a similar structure. It's got a, an accusative plus infinitive kind of structure. So they compelled, and then orgetorigem is accusative, and dikere is an infinitive. So they compelled orgetorix to say. And then uh, dikere has a direct object. That's kausam. So literally, according to their customs, they compelled orgetorix to say his cause. Finally, ex vinculis means in chains, as you can see from footnote one below. A vinculum is like a, a little link of some kind. And so if you have lots of links together, that makes a chain. One other note here, and that is that Kausam and Dikre have sort of a specific kind of legal meaning. To say your cause here really means more like to plead your case. And as you can see, footnote two says, causam dikere means to plead your case or to stand trial. So basically, the Helvetian government finds out what Orgetrix has been up to. He gets in big trouble. They find that he's been trying to basically stage a coup and take over all of Gaul. And so they put him in chains. They basically arrest him, and they put him in chains, and they haul him into court. And so now he's got to explain himself. So this part says, according to their customs, they compelled Orgetrix to plead his case in chains. From an analytical perspective, you could look at Orgetorigem through dicere as a noun clause that is the direct object of koegerunt. Moving on to the next sentence, we have damnatum poinam sequi oportebat ut igni cremaretur. Here we have the impersonal verb oportebat. That means it was fitting, it was proper, it was necessary something like that. The authors of this book would like us to translate the verb oporto as to be necessary. I personally prefer something like it is fitting, it is right, it is proper. So the whole thing here hinges on oportebat. So we'll start out the sentence with saying it was fitting or it was right or it was proper. And then we will have an accusative plus infinitive construction. Poinam will be a subject accusative and sequi will be an infinitive verb saying what the poinam is doing. Poinam is the first declension noun poina, which means punishment. And then sequi means follow. That's an infinitive. So what we have so far is it was fitting that punishment follow. Damnatum is a perfect passive participle. As you can see in footnote three, it means a person who has been condemned. There's an understood aum referring to uh, orgetorix. So if you throw in the word aum, it would say, it was fitting that punishment follow him. Him in the sense of him being condemned. Damnatum. And the sense here is if he should be condemned, 
You can see in the footnote it says it has a conditional force. It was fitting that punishment should follow him being condemned in the sense of if he was condemned. And now we're left with just one last part. That's this ut clause at the end. Ut igni cremaretur. We've seen the verb cremo in our vocabulary for this lesson. That means to burn. Cremaretur is imperfect subjunctive, and it's passive, third person singular. And then igni is ablative singular. It means by means of fire. Put it all together, and it's he should be burned by fire in the sense of burned to death. It's some kind of method of execution, probably something like uh, burning someone at the stake. So it's an ut clause with a subjunctive verb. So if we wanted to classify this, how would we classify it? Is it a purpose clause? It was fitting that punishment should follow him being condemned so that he might be burned to death? No, that doesn't really make sense. Is it a result clause? Punishment should follow him condemned with the result that he be burned to death? That's not exactly how we've seen result clauses work. Could it be an indirect command? Do we have a verb of commanding or requesting or asking or demanding? It was fitting that punishment should follow him condemned, condemned as in assigned to be or asked to be burned to death. And so it's an indirect command. That's not exactly it either. It's kind of similar to that. But here's my take on this ut clause. At face value, it's easy to translate. We translate ut as that, and then we say that he be burned to death. So we know what it says in English. We know how to translate it. But if we wanted to classify that particular ut clause and give it a name, what would we give it? So I did a little bit of searching around. I looked in Allen and Greenow, which is considered to be sort of the uh, granddaddy of all Latin textbooks. I've mentioned it many times before. In section 563, they list all the different kinds of ut clauses. They've got purpose clauses, indirect commands, clauses of fearing, clauses of wishing, result clauses, all that kind of thing. And this would actually be a good review for you. You can get Allen and Greenow for free on the internet as a PDF. In fact, they have an excellent online version at the Dickinson College website. So that's a great resource. So again, if you look at section 563 and go to section D, it says verbs of determining, decreeing, resolving, bargaining take either the subjunctive or the infinitive. And they have some examples there. And one of the examples is someone decreeing that the consuls shall hold a levy. And so in that example, they have ut plus a subjunctive verb. And again, Allen and Greenow calls this verbs of determining, decreeing, resolving, or bargaining. And so that's what I'm going to argue is the kind of ut clause that we see here. What I think it is, is that the word damnatum has a quality to it of determining or decreeing or resolving. Just like in section D in Allen and Greenow, just as they describe there. And so I think that ut igni cremaretur is an ut clause of determining or decreeing or resolving that is working from whatever is being communicated by the word damnatum. Again, this is an ut clause with verbs of determining, decreeing, or resolving. And so if you've been condemned, that is in fact a determination or a decree. So let's try reading it that way. And let's translate damnatum as something that helps bring out what I'm talking about here. Let, let's translate it as decree. Just for fun, just, to, just as an experiment. It was fitting that punishment should follow 
him having been decreed that he be burned with fire. See, when I translate it that way, it starts to make a little bit more sense. And so that's what I think is going on with ut igni crema retur. It's not an indirect command, kind of similar to one. It's not a purpose clause. It's not a clause of fearing. It's not a result clause. It's the kind of clause described in Allen and Greenow, section 563, part D, an ut clause with verbs of determining, decreeing, resolving, or bargaining, working from the word damnatum. So this entire last sentence will say something like this. It was fitting that punishment should follow him having been condemned that he be burned to death. Or you could even say having been sentenced that he be burned to death. Something like that that brings out the fact that damnatum is a determination or a resolution to something that can then drive an ut clause as described in the section I mentioned. Okay, so the ut clause here is an ut clause of determining, decreeing, or resolving from section 563 in Allen and Greenow, part D. And if you want to read more about it, you can read that section in Allen and Greenow. Okay, that brings us to the end of another installment of Linney's Latin class. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next time in Lesson 55.